Welcome to New Hope Ministries. New Hope Ministries is a part of New Hope Community Church in Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania. Please visit our website at www.NewHopeCommunityFMChurch.org. Now here's Pastor Michael with this week's message, Discover Your Motivational Gifts Teacher. We are now in the teacher part of our gifts. We studied through three gifts so far. This is our third gift that we're going into. We talked about the perceiver gift. How if someone is working in a perceiver gift spiritually, it can be very amazing. As well as the server gift. How amazing that can be as well. And today we're going to talk about the teacher. The teacher. They research and teach the Bible. They also meet the mental needs of the church. They will keep us studying and they will keep us learning. First Peter 4.10 says, As each of you has received a gift, employ it for one another as good trustees of God's many-sided grace. Faithful stewards of extremely diverse powers and gifts granted to Christians by a merited favor. Um, when you hear the word grace or mercy sometimes in the Bible, especially mercy, um, it's spoken of as a gift and that God gives a certain amount of it to each person. It says in Romans chapter 12, Verse 5, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts. So according to the grace given us, that means that God is giving us that gift. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. And here's the part we're getting to. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, the compassion gift, let them do it cheerfully. The teacher, exceptionally gifted with intelligence. These are men and women who are always asking questions. They want to know the basis of every single thing, and they will search until the facts show something is true. I had a professor in college. His name was Bruce. He was extremely detailed and taught me not to accept what is said, but to research it and to figure it out for myself. Which is not a bad thing. There are a lot of people on social media today, and what they do is they post stuff. Then later, because they didn't research, they didn't double check it, they didn't triple check it, they find it not to be true. It's just some random website that's just posting stuff. You know, I've even gotten caught up in that. And, and even if you're not a teacher, a good thing that you need to do is to check something, and when you find something, to double check it, and then to triple check it. Now, the teacher gift also obviously operates out of the mind, area of the soul. The teachers are the mind of the body of Christ. Uh, it says in this verse, Now the Berean Jews... They were of noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with eagerness, and they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. That's important to do. If someone is teaching you the Bible, discipling you, sharing with you, it's important for you to study and, and to, to find out if those things are correct or not. You are to teach others in appropriate ways. And we should all be prepared to teach. 
each and every one of us here are called, like we talked about earlier, to disciple and to teach. We should be teachable, but we should also be teaching. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study and be eager and do your utmost to present yourself to God approved, tested by trial, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing, rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. We should all teach one another. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word spoken by Christ, the Messiah, have its home in your hearts and minds and dwell with you in all its richness. As you teach and admonish and train one another in all insight and intelligence and wisdom in spiritual things, and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody to God with his grace in your heart. We should all teach others to obey the commands of Jesus. And, and it's really important to understand that, and in this word, this scripture is saying that, is that you're not just, when you're, not, when you're learning, you're not just learning with the mind. That's the problem with atheism nowadays, is that people are too top-heavy. They're attempting to learn something with their mind. And there's nothing wrong with that. But in the case of Christ, in the case of the Bible, in the case of faith, all those things must be learned also with the heart. And not only must you learn with your head, but you must be prepared to learn with your heart. You must be prepared to open your soul and your spirit so that your spirit may come alive. And that's the issue, is that most atheists, they, they, they want to figure out God with their heads. And they think, well, that's impossible. God can't do that. And God can't do this. And that, that can't happen. And this can't happen. When, when it's a matter of the heart. It says here in this verse, we should learn... And we should grow in our hearts and our minds. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, Plethuno, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always. To the very end of the age, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Now, a really good example of a teacher is Apollos. He's the biblical example of a teacher I want to show you today. Let me read these verses to you. A, meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more accurately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. I planted a seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. Now, let's break it down. Let's look at Apollo's spiritual motivational gifts as um, foretold in your gift testings. As we look at these verses, verse 24 says, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. So number one, he's logical. He's also cultured. 
Number three, he's well-versed in scripture. Number nine, he has an eloquent vocabulary. And number 15, he is intellectually sharp. Number verse 25, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. So, number one, again, he's logical. Number two, he uses accurate facts. Number three, he is a student and a researcher. Number five, he has a biblical focus. And number 13, he has a teaching focus. And number 16, he is diligent. Verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more accurately adequately. So number seven, this is important. He's open to new truth. He's teachable. Number nine, he speaks impressively. And number 19, he has strong convictions. Verse 27, when Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who, by grace, had believed. Number 12, he helps fellow believers. Number 15, he aims at the Greek culture, which he is in. And 19, he takes along convictions that are based upon facts. Verse 28, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. So number one, he proves the truth of the gospel. Number nine, he speaks impressively. Number 13, he uses biblical base. Number 15, he uses his intellect. And number 19, he has strong convictions. In verse six, I planted seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. Verse number 12, he teaches believers. And number 20, he believes that truth produces change. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God's truth will produce change? Now, I want to look at Jesus' characteristics. Remember, Jesus had all the gifts. Let's look at these um, things real quick. Number one, he taught God's truth. That's just a given. Matthew 13, 31, it says, He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. And, and not only did he teach God's truth, but he used culture to teach it. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to be teaching we also need to be using culture. I was in Israel. I held a mustard seed. I went to a mustard tree that was huge. And there I took a little tiny, tiny seed about. If you took a pen and you just put a little dot on your hand, that would be a mustard seed. And that little tiny mustard seed made that big, huge tree. And that's what Jesus did. He taught, but when he taught, he used culture to teach. Number two, he fulfilled the law. Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Number three, he quoted scripture. Matthew 4, 4 and Deuteronomy 3, Jesus answered, it's written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And that's really important to understand because Jesus used that in an attack against him from the enemy. He used scripture to go against the enemy. When the enemy was attacking him, he used the sword of the spirit. He blocked him with the shield of faith and he struck him with the sword of truth. 
That's really important to understand if you get attacked. And then Deuteronomy 3, he humbled you because you no longer hunger. And then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known. To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So he uses Deuteronomy to attack the devil. Now I want to give you a warning. I've done that with every single one of these. Gave you warnings about the perceiver, gave you warnings about the servant, and now I'm here to give you a warning about the teacher. If you are a teacher, you are not praying enough, you're not reading your Bible enough, you're not spiritually grounded. A teacher who is not spiritually grounded, this is what can take place with them. They can be very intolerant. They can be very legalistic. And I have to tell you this, if you think that you're not legalistic, if you think, well, God's gotten rid of the legalism in my life, and uh, I can speak through example, that you may think that, well, I'm not legalistic anymore. Well, God can show you where you still may have legalism in your life. Being dogmatic, you can wind up being dogmatic if you're not spiritually grounded. You can be opinionated if you are not spiritually grounded. You can be aloof. You can be unromantic. Or in a bad way, you can have a know-it-all attitude. You know, we, we went to Israel and when we did, we had a tour guide. His name was Munzer. Munzer was an amazing teacher. He was extremely knowledgeable. Every single place that we went to, he had a crazy amount of knowledge about where we were going and what we were doing. And I learned so much from that man. But then time started to run out and he had all these things he wanted to teach us and all these places he wanted to take us and all the things that he wanted to do with us. And as the time ran out, he began to go crazy because he couldn't fit everything in, in that he wanted to. And he began to actually start making mistakes. And it was pretty crazy as we ran out of time in Israel. And you have to be careful of that as a teacher. Um, if you're a teacher and you're a pastor, it's so important. You can take all this stuff and you learn so much. And when I was in school, that's what I had to learn. I had to learn to take and learn every single piece of information about a sermon, but then say, okay, what do I need to take out of this? Because people aren't going to want me to sit and talk for an hour and a half about what's going on. There may be a couple people, a couple teachers in this audience who are like, yeah, preach it. I want to hear more. Hour and a half? Sure, I'll listen to everything you have that you learned that the Holy Spirit led you to, get, to receive. But there are other people who have different gifts, and it's a struggle for them. So 20 minutes is good. So I'm trying to teach you in 20 minutes. It's really, really important. So I have to cut out a lot of stuff when I do sermons. I have to take out stuff because I want you to get and I have to pray about what, what are the things that people are going to need to hear? What are the things that people are going to need to learn? And then take out the stuff that I learned that isn't that important, but is important to me because I like to learn that stuff. The teacher and evangelism. Teachers will want to know the facts. They'll want reliable proof for what you're sharing. In other words, you can give them the gospel, give them scriptures, give them all those things, but you need to pray a lot that it will break them and that it will open their hearts. For example, why do you think God sent Jesus to live on this earth? Look at this verse. Isn't it compelling proof that Jesus was the unique son of God? Have you ever considered the claims of Christ and are they valid? 
And teachers may want to read through the New Testament. They want, may want to gain the facts needed to make an individual decision based upon what they've learned. And that's why we need to pray a lot, because teachers will want to study and learn the facts. And if you're going to share Jesus with a teacher, you better be prepared to give evidence. Because teachers want evidence. They want evidence of what's taking place. As we close, I hope there are teachers here today. I hope you learned something today. But remember, you all have a teaching gift. Maybe your lowest gift. There are certain things in my gift that are low, but sometimes I'm called to use them. I'm not the best perceiver, but sometimes I'm called to be a perceiver and to use certain things. I'm not the best at other gifts, but I may be called to do those things. I'm not called. My high gift is not serving, but I'm called to serve. So I hope that you learned something today. Let's pray. Father God, we give you praise. We give you thanks for everything that you are. I ask, Lord, that you just continue to bless and to move in our congregation. Help us to understand our gifts so that we may use them not only to bring joy to our lives, but to disciple other people. And I thank you for that. I give you praise for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you enjoyed this message today, then please visit our website at www.NewHopeCommunityFMChurch.org. Click on the image scroller and subscribe on this podcast. And remember, there's always new hope in Jesus. God bless you.